in the elections of 2018, the midterm elections, do you know how many people voted out of those who were eligible to vote? Just slightly more than half. 50.3, to be exact, 50.3% of eligible voters in the United States in the 2018 midterm elections actually cast a vote. Let's make that different this year. Let's get active, let's participate, let's carry out our moral responsibility. Welcome to a new episode of the National Prayer Luncheon for Life Pro-Life Impact Show. This week is a special episode as we find ourselves once again in the season of a very critical midterm election. You know, we are so blessed to live in this country and to be citizens of this great country founded by our founding fathers for we the people to be governed of the people, by the people, for the people. And we have this amazing, beautiful gift, this right to vote and be involved in the political process and how we are governed. So for this week's episode, I have invited and spoken with our dear friend, Father Frank Pavone, who has a beautiful series of election teaching videos. There are 13 of them. He actually recorded these in 2020. And um, we thought it would be a really good idea to share two of those short videos with you for this week's episode for education, inspiration, and motivation, and also to be able to share with others about the importance of voting. So the the, uh, messages that we will be sharing with you from Father Frank are voting an aspect of loving God and neighbor, and also don't sit out the elections. It's so critically important. So with that, I will um, take let Father Frank take it away on the teachings and then close this week's episode with prayer. So here's Father Frank. Hello, friends. This is Father Frank Pavone. I'm the National Director of Priests for Life. Welcome to this special video series about Elections 2020. Did you know that there are some 100,000 races taking place in the 2020 elections at all levels of government? It's so important for believers to be involved. And this video series is going to tell you why and how. Why should we be involved in elections. Why should we vote? How do we decide for whom to vote? What is the relationship between the various issues in their magnitude of importance? Do elections really matter? This and so much more will be the subject of this series of brief videos which you can share with family, friends, and fellow believers with your pro-life groups and your churches. We will post them online together with all our other election-related information at prolifevote.com. That's where we ask you to go during this election season. That can be your go-to place for the inspiration, the education, the motivation you need for voting. Not just the theoretical, and we will be talking to you about that, but the practical. How do you make sure that your vote counts? And then how do you enable other voters to be involved in the process so that their vote counts? That's what this series will be about. And we're going to start today with some very basic reflections right from the scriptures. The Word of God has a lot to say about voting. And this series will speak to all of you who believe in the Word of God, whether you are Catholic or not, if you belong to any portion of the body of Christ, any denomination or no denomination, but you are a follower of the Lord Jesus, this video series is for you. And then for those of you who are Catholics, we will also make reference to special documents that the church has issued, such as this one called Living the Gospel of Life, issued by the American bishops back in 1998. It's teachings very clear and solid about voting and elections. Brothers and sisters, we vote because we are members of this earthly society. Yes, we are citizens of heaven. 
we are also here on earth, we are citizens of our various nations, and there's a reason for that. The reason is articulated by St. Paul in his letter to the Romans. Let every person be subordinate to the higher authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority oppose what God, opposes what God has appointed. And those who oppose it will bring judgment upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear to good conduct, but to evil. Do you wish to have no fear of authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive approval from it. For it is a servant of God for your good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword without purpose. It is the servant of God to inflict wrath on the evildoer. Therefore, it is necessary to be subject, not only because of the wrath, but also because of conscience. This is why you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Pay to all their dues, taxes to whom taxes are due, toll to whom toll is due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. That's Romans 13, verses 1 to 7. Now, does that sound to you like advice to go separate yourself from the political realm, have nothing to do with the governing authorities of this world because, oh, well, after all, God is my king. Of course God is our king, and our king has placed us here, in this world, in this nation, in this life. And he, Paul is very clear in this passage, he has set up the authorities. Of course, God is the Lord of all. Jesus Christ is Lord, Alpha and Omega, stretching from one end of the universe to the other. But God has established earthly authorities, the Word of God is telling us. This is very clear language. And notice, three times in this passage, not once, not twice, but three times, this phrase, servant of God, or ministers of God, arises in regard to the civil authorities. It's not only the clergy who are ministers of God. Scripture tells us that the civil authorities, your president, your senators, your representatives, your governors, your lawmakers, your mayors, anyone serving in public authority is serving because that authority is delegated to them by God. They are ministers of God. Now, there's a similar passage. Let me just quote it and then draw for you a couple of conclusions. In the uh, first letter of St. Peter in the New Testament, starting with uh, chapter 2, starting with verse 13. So 1 Peter 2, 13. Be subject to every human institution for the Lord's sake. Again, same theme as Paul was articulating. Now, this is Peter. Be subject to every human institution for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or to governors as sent by him. Sent by him. Again, that theme of ministers of God, right? Sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the approval of those who do good. For it is the will of God that by doing good you may silence the ignorance of foolish people. Be free, yet without using freedom as a pretext for evil but as slaves of God. Give honor to all, love the community, fear God, honor the king. Same themes here as in Romans 13, 1 Peter 2, same themes. God has established the authority, respect it, obey it, cooperate with it, take part in it. That's where voting comes in. Not just voting, but then lobbying and communicating with your elected representatives and working with them to develop good policies and then to implement those good, those good policies. And why should we care about the policies that are implemented by our lawmakers and enforced by the executives and judged about by the courts? Why should we be concerned about that? Look what Peter says here. Love the community. Did you ever think about voting did you ever think about elections as an aspect of love of God and love of neighbor? 
Now, those are the two great commandments that Jesus gave us, right? And he said the one is, is like the other. What are the greatest commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. What does that have to do with elections? What does that have to do with voting? What does that have to do with civic authority? Scriptures here are telling us. You love the community. Well, first of all, you love God and you fear God. If God has established the authorities, if God is telling you to be subject to the authorities, then part of loving God is dealing with those authorities in the right way. And, and Paul says the right way, Peter says the right way is do good. And the authorities will be on your side because you're on theirs. But they're ordained by God. So loving God means being a good citizen here on earth. Not only obeying just laws, but helping to create them. Because we don't, we don't get a, 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 the opportunity only to obey those in authority. We get to choose them. They work for us. And so we get to choose them, and that's what elections are all about. But notice then this theme about loving the community. Think about it this way. Politics, the word politics, it's broader than partisan politics. Politics, in a broad sense, is how do we organize ourselves in this world? How do we organize ourselves in the, in the, in the community uh, of our nation and our cities, towns, and villages in such a way that we can live our lives peaceably, that power can be rightly exercised, that resources and goods can be properly and equitably distributed, that rights that everybody has can be adequately protected. How do we do this? That's the political world. That's the political life. We can't ignore that. If we subtract ourselves from that, we're not properly loving the community. We're not loving our neighbor. Because part of loving our neighbor, and, and it starts with loving our own families, right? The families we have now, and then we think about our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, their children. We think about what kind of nation will they have? How will they be protected from terrorism? How will they be protected in their, in their economic life? The, the way that we set up our public policies, which therefore depends on the kind of policymakers that we vote into office in elections, impacts the people we love, impacts our families, impacts the neighbors that Christ commanded us to love. So if you love the community, like Peter says here, if you love your neighbor, like Jesus commands, well, then it matters to you who's in public office. Again, how is power going to be exercised? How are goods going to be distributed? How are rights going to be protected? You know, one of the policies that our president was talking about recently was uh, the right to try. Let me use that as an example. You know, for the longest time, experimental drugs that are being developed to help to treat uh, diseases, people weren't able to use them because they, 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 they're, they're not approved. Yet, by the FDA, they're still in an experimental phase. But people were proposing, and the president agreed, well, if people are terminally ill, if they're going to die, why not give them one last chance to try a drug that might help? And so he changed the policy in such a way that people who want to do it can do it now. And it's having a good effect. That's a public policy that if you help to bring that about because you listen to a candidate say here's what I want to do if I'm elected and then you vote for that person and then that person is is in a position where they can change that policy and then they do it and then people are helped you see how that's part of loving your neighbor that's part of doing good to your neighbor that's part of loving the community you've brought into effect a policy that is helping other people not to mention of course the fundamental problem of abortion when we elect lawmakers who will make laws that will protect defenseless babies, you are loving your neighbor in the most fundamental way, protecting their life. So I hope that these simple lessons from these two passages of Scripture will start us off on the right foot here, my friends, understanding that religion and politics actually do mix. There's a moral dimension to our political life. Jesus is Lord of every aspect of our life. 
of all our choices and decisions and activities, including those in the voting booth. Yes, we are citizens of his kingdom. And here we are strangers and in exile. But the fact is we are here. And the authorities here have, in fact, been established by God. Let's cooperate with them. Let's elect them wisely. Let's be full and active citizens. So for more information, friends, ProLifeVote.com is where you want to go. Pray for the outcome of these elections of 2020 at ElectionPrayer.com. And volunteer if you want to help in more specific ways the elections in your local community and beyond. ProLifeVolunteer.com. Sign up there and we'll be in touch with you about ways you can be even more involved. ProLifeVolunteer.com. This is Father Frank Pavone of Priests for Life. Thanks for watching. Please share this video and please stay tuned for our entire series of election-related videos for these elections of 2020. God bless you. Well, hello, brothers and sisters. I'm Father Frank Pavone, National Director of Priests for Life. Welcome to another episode in our series of election videos at electionvideos.org to help our fellow believers and our fellow citizens to prepare for the elections of this year. You know, at every Mass, we ask forgiveness of God for what we have done and what we have failed to do. And when it comes to elections and voting, we can sin both ways. A person might sin by voting for someone or some proposal that advances evil and that works against the common good. Or a person might sin in failing to vote and thereby allowing the worst of the alternatives to get elected and take power and do damage. Either way, we are responsible. You know, sometimes people feel like the choices they have are all unacceptable. And of course, we always have to remind ourselves there is no such thing as an election in which we have the choice of a perfect candidate. We're always choosing between one imperfection and another. But the fact of the matter is we can choose and we can often discern the better of the two options or two or more options. We can discern, we can make a judgment about which option is best and then the morally proper thing to do is to choose the best of the options. When we fail to do so because we want to sit out an election, when we fail to do so out of frustration with all the choices that we have, when we fail to do so because we think it's not going to make a difference, when we fail to do so because cynicism takes over our mind and heart and we say, never mind this whole thing, I don't want to get involved in the messy business of politics. When we fail to vote and then as a result, the worst of the two options gets into power, we share responsibility for what happens next. In other words, we cannot escape our electoral responsibility. We may think we're escaping it by sitting out an election, but we're not. Just think of it in simple terms. If 10 people vote for one person and 10 people vote for the other person and you don't vote for either one, your vote makes the difference. And many people added up together make a lot of differences. Many races are very close. The United States bishops wrote in Living the Gospel of Life, every voice matters in the public forum, every vote counts. You know, there's a, an interesting list that we publish on our ProLifeVote.com website of close elections in U.S. history. Let me go through a few of these just again to reinforce the fact that every vote counts. Most notably, of course, in recent history, Governor George W. Bush won the presidency because of 537 votes in a single state that is Florida. That flipped the election in his favor. The state of New Mexico in that same election 
uh, got uh, just uh, 366 more votes for Al Gore in his race against George W. Bush. 366. These are not big margins. In the 2012 Iowa Republican caucuses, the initial returns gave Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney a victory by eight votes. In the final tally, it was actually Senator Rick Santorum who won by 34 votes. These are not massive numbers of tens or hundreds of thousands or millions. Incumbent Republican Mike Kelly defeated Democrat challenger Carl Castle by one vote for an Alaska House seat in 2008. Al Franken took a U.S. Senate seat for Minnesota from incumbent Norm Coleman in 2008 after two recounts. Coleman led by 206 votes on the first count, but then Franken led by 225 in the recount and then by 312 in the third effort. In 2004, Gene Schmidt appeared to have won the Republican primary for the 14th district seat in Ohio by a mere 62 votes. But after a recount, Tom Niehaus was awarded the nomination with 22 more votes and went on to win the general election. There are many more examples of this. The point is that this is not just a political reality. My friends, this is a moral reality. We are responsible for what we have done and for what we have failed to do. And by failing to exercise a vote, we may be failing to advance the common good or failing to prevent a worse thing from happening. You know, sometimes people think of a vote as if it's a philosophical statement that they are making or something that is supposed to make them feel better. But it is neither. A vote is a very practical thing. It's a transfer of power to someone who will either advance the common good or work against the common good. Again, to quote our bishops, every voice matters in the public forum. Every vote counts. Let's make sure we don't sit out the election and let's remember even if we think we should sit it out, we are not escaping our moral responsibility. Even if we do not vote, we share responsibility for the outcome. In the elections of 2018, the midterm elections, do you know how many people voted out of those who were eligible to vote? Just slightly more than half, 50.3 to be exact, 50.3% of eligible voters in the United States in the 2018 midterm elections actually cast a vote. Let's make that different this year. Let's get active, let's participate, let's carry out our moral responsibility. If you want to see more episodes of these election vote videos, just go to electionvideos.org. We invite you to share this information far and wide. Let's help our fellow citizens be well prepared. So grateful to God for the gift of Father Frank and that very clear teaching. And now as we, we go to the polls, uh, early voting has been taking place in a number of states. If you think that there's not the chance that you can make it to the polls on election day, November 8th. Please be sure to get to the polls to early vote before Tuesday. And if not, vote on Tuesday so that you can be involved and have a voice in the governing of our beautiful country. So let us bow our heads in prayer. Father, we are so grateful to you for the gift of citizenship in this wonderful, wonderful country. Thank you for the gift of our land. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for the victories that have been won over the years in the battle for life, this war, and especially now in our post-Roe America. The battle still rages in many, many states, and we will continue until that day when every single life is protected. 
Father, we ask that you would be with all of us as we cast our votes this year, Lord. We we pray for the, the election process. We pray that it would be free and fair. And may your will be done, Lord. We pray it in Jesus' holy name. Thank you again for joining us this week. And we are, as as I share each week, we are in nominations season ourselves for the 2023 Pro-Life Impact Award and $100,000 in Pro-Life Impact Grants. So be sure to make your nomination. You can nominate for a local, state, or national pro-life organization. You can do multiple submissions, except one per organization, but you can definitely submit as many as you would like to be considered to be honored. Find us at nationalprayerluncheonforlife.org. We thank you again for joining us, and we lift to you, always in our hearts and prayers, you and all of your intentions. I look forward to seeing you again next week. God bless you. Thank you for joining today's show. And be sure to subscribe to our National Prayer Luncheon for Life Pro-Life Impact Podcast Show and help spread the word. Come back every week to learn how you can make the greatest impact to help save lives from the evil of abortion. God bless.